You've just landed Inside Launch Street, the innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate and differentiate and get further faster in this crazy cluttered world. And now, innovation thought leader and your super fly host, Tamara Kleinberg. Another great week, Launch Streeters. Tamara here, your guide, and yes, that left-handed person that always has to sit at the end of the dinner table so that we don't knock elbows all night long. That is so annoying. Okay, did you know that we need to spend time with people that we don't agree with? I know, it's not always easy, but it will help you be more innovative and make better decisions. Jennifer Reel, author of Creating Great Choices and an adjunct professor at the Rotman School of Management at University of Toronto, she specializes in creative problem solving. She stopped by Inside Laundry to talk about all of this. So we dig into how challenging our own thinking with the opposite views of others is so important and why people with different perspectives actually help us not just get to richer and more robust ideas, but actually better decision making. She also shares the key to that better decision making, something that she calls integrative thinking, which is about using tension to create great choices. Yeah, you need to go out there and create more tension. Ooh, let's learn about how. I think you'll really like the part about why seeking to fall in love with other people's perspectives is the best thing you can do. And she doesn't mean that flippantly. There's actually a lot of intention behind that. Okay, let's get to it. Jennifer, I'm very much looking forward to today's conversation. Me too. Let's dig in. What is the one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? I was thinking about this and I, I thought perhaps it would be surprising. I'm Canadian and I am one of the few Canadians who has never played ice hockey, <laughs> ever, but I have gone curling. Oh, so here's my question about curling. Mm. Is it hard? Does the puck or whatever you call it get away from you? <laughs> so in curling, you, you roll the stone down the, the stone. Ice. Yes. <laughs> and, um, it is hard if you're like me and not terribly coordinated, even when you are on solid ground as opposed to on slippery ice. So I did a fair amount of falling on my butt. It was uh, it was a fair amount of that. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to try it. So maybe one day we'll go curling together. You should try it. Come up to Canada. There's a lot of it here. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, I want to dig in with you on innovation. And I actually wanted to start with a, a little bit of a different question than I normally do, uh, just given your background and your experience. You know, I think in, in innovation, we're often told to avoid the yes butters, the people who don't agree with us. But you are, have a really big kind of stake in the ground around seeking out and spending time with the people that actually disagree with you, that provoke you. Tell us why that is. Let's start there. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. We do take a, a strong stance that there's meaningful value in spending time around people who see the world differently than you do. And in fact, even who might see the world in opposite ways uh, to you. And it, it really goes back to the way we see and understand the world. So it, it feels to many of us like we have access to all the wonderful complexities of reality. And it turns out that our brain doesn't really work quite that way. There's more complexity in the world than we can take in and make sense of in real time. So every time we encounter a person, a place, a thing, an idea, anything, we are building these simplified models in our mind that that's, that's how we understand the world. And that's useful and important and, and helps us get through the day. But what it means is, even in those situations where we believe we have the full, robust, right answer, we are operating on the basis of incomplete models. The only way you have a hope of improving your model, of, of challenging your thinking and making it better, is by talking to people who see something you don't see. They have access to a different understanding of the world, and it can provoke you negatively. You can say, well, they're just wrong and there's nothing to be learned, but that means your model is finished. You're not going to go any further with it. Or you can say, interesting, I don't agree. It doesn't feel right to me, the perspective you've got, but what can I learn by listening to you? What do you see 
that I don't see. And we just believe that's an extraordinarily valuable way to learn about the world, about other people, and to make your own thinking richer and more robust. Can you give me a, a, a personal or work example of maybe a time where you've been in that, where you had your, you know, I love how you said that the incomplete model is such a great way to think about it because it's not about right or wrong. It's just about, you know, how much information and view of the world that I have versus you. But for you, a time where you've had that and somebody else's opposing view and what you did with it. <laughs> um, well, I, I often tell this story because it's sort of the, the single most uh, viscerally negative teaching experience I ever had. It was this moment that is seared into, into my memory. I was teaching a group of healthcare folks and it was the first time I'd ever engaged with a group of healthcare leaders. Most of my teaching is with executives and, and MBAs and undergraduate commerce students. And so this group of of physicians and other healthcare leaders, and we're talking about opposing models, and and I raised the issue of vaccines, and um, the immediate dramatic reaction in the room. Um, I used the words "vaccine debate," mm -hmm. and a booming voice from the back of the room <laughs> sort of commandingly tells me, "You know, excuse me, there is no debate about vaccines," and. Um, I was taken a little aback because from a, a pure scientific perspective, that's true. Vaccines um, are safe and effective and everyone should vaccinate their kids. It provides herd immunity. It's wonderful. The link that was posited between autism and, and uh, vaccines has been as repudiated as it possibly can be scientifically. But the conversation we ended up having was, was um, you know, we've been saying that as a medical community for 20 years and it's not working, mm -hmm. right? Like we right. tell Everyone. We're not actually convincing the people who aren't convinced. Right. And fewer people are convinced every year. Right. Every year, fewer people vaccinate their children than the year before. And it's not um, that these people are uneducated or unsophisticated. In some cases, it's um, Marin County in, in California is, is one of the wealthiest communities in, in America. And they have very low vaccination rates relative to other parts of the country. And, and so we wound up having a really interesting conversation in which I said, I think you have to ask yourself if the approach we're taking right now in which we say we have all the science, it's 100 percent infallible. We know for sure the right answer. You must do what we're telling you. If that's not working and is producing the opposite effect of what we would want, is there anything you could learn from engaging in a conversation, genuine curiosity about what it is that a parent who opposes giving vaccines on your schedule um, might believe or care about or focus on? Um, that might at least change how you speak to them, might at least change the conversation. And it's not about saying, fine, vaccine, vaccines are not, you know, we'll walk away from the science. It's not that. But it's saying what we're doing today is actually pushing people away from us. It's making it impossible to hear. Why do you think it's so hard for us to hear or internalize or maybe be open to opposing, provocative, different views than our own? I think there are a couple of, of reasons. I think first, we're educated in a way that suggests there are right answers and wrong answers. And our job is to find the right answer. The right answer is the one in the back of the book. And you put your hand up first and um, you get real rewards for certainty and clarity about the right answer. Um, but I also think that cognitive biases make it, it really hard. I think that um, there's good evidence from the work that Daniel Kahneman and the other behavioral economists have done to help us understand that we like people who think like us. We have greater empathy for people who look and sound like us. We believe everyone sees the world the way that we do. And those biases make it really hard to understand why and how someone might see the world differently. Um, and then the third piece is, uh, I don't know if you've ever read any work by Jonathan Haidt, who's a, an ethics uh, professor at uh, NYU Stern. Mm, I haven't. He's fantastic. He wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. Um, a, a number of years ago, and it's incredibly prescient and, and relevant to the conversations we're having right now, especially in America. And he says, you know, people on the left and people on the right um, use different bases for their arguments. They, they sort of call back to different sources of information or, or different ways of validating their perspectives. And so we really are drawing from different data pools, looking to different authorities, thinking about different things. And when someone says something that is in opposition to what we believe, we just simply can't 
fathom how they got there, where it came from. And it is easier, cognitively easier, emotionally easier Mm. to just say they're wrong rather than to seek to deeply engage with and understand what that person actually uh, believes and why. Well, it sounds like too, then you have to really dig into, I think what you just said, the why behind it. Okay. That's mm-hmm. what they believe, but where's all this coming from? I want, I want to talk a little bit about your book. So creating mm-hmm. great choices. And I love that, that you focused on great choices. <laughs> so I'd love to dig a little bit into that, but you mentioned, um, and you teach on the power of integrative thinking. So can you explain what that is and how we're supposed to use it? Absolutely. So integrative thinking is a, a theory that comes from my co-author, Roger Martin, um, about 15 years ago, he became dean here at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto and spent time early in his his uh, tenure figuring out what he might teach to our students that would actually help them be successful as leaders in the long run. And the idea of integrative thinking um, came out of his, his work with highly successful leaders. And he'd observed that a number of them, those who'd been very successful over a long period of time in their career, tackled their most difficult choices in a way that looked and felt a little different than most of us do. So most of us tend to accept um, that we have to act quickly and decisively, that when we are confronted with a hard trade-off, our job is to weigh the pros and cons um, and choose the option that comes out best or least worst in, in the analysis of the pros and cons of those options. And integrative thinking says you have another choice. If the options on the table do not really solve the problem, if choosing one means giving up too much of the other um, and you wish there was a better answer, it is your job to create that better answer, that you can actually use those existing models, in particular the ones that are opposing models or, or really in tension with each other, to help you create a better answer, an answer that actually brings new value, does a better job of solving the problem. And that these highly successful leaders just saw it as their job to create great choices rather than choose between existing options. So I got two questions here, two layers, I guess. So the first one is a little bit of a backup, but how do you know when the solutions on the table are not the right ones? I think I I find that sometimes even with the clients that we work with, you know, you almost get Um, trained into just, okay, that one works. It's a Band-Aid, right? It's good enough. That'll work. So you kind of buy into, yeah, that will work. So how do you know, how do you know your starting point of, nope, we need to keep searching. And then how do I kind of move into that? Yeah. And uh, so I would say for a lot of decisions, that'll do or good enough is just fine, right? Yeah. If the stakes aren't extraordinarily high, um, if you have the ability to, to pivot and, and reverse course later, if the people in the organization are, are comfortable with the choice that you're making and, and feel like they can move forward, life is short. Choose. Right? Just go ahead and make the choice. But there is a subset of, of choices that we face as leaders where you have an emotional reaction, where you feel in your gut this sense that these choices don't actually solve my problem. I can feel myself compromising. I can feel myself settling. And I know that this problem really matters. It's a big bet on the future that's going to be hard to reverse. The organization is really torn. I've got folks who are lined up behind competing options, and it's going to be really difficult to shift them from that. So there are a set of conditions that, that you can start to recognize in which Um, you can say it is worth spending some time seeking a better answer rather than just compromising or satisficing or choosing and moving on. You know, I think just for launch treaters out there listening, what was really powerful to me is when you feel like you're compromising or settling that Jennifer and what you said makes me go, Oh, you know what? That is how I know it's not really the best choice or the best solution for whatever the challenge or the opportunity is. So when you get to that place and you want to seek a better answer, what do you do next? Because I have to imagine that you maybe thought or maybe your team thought that you pulled all the data you could to just get to that okay choice. Yeah. So what we do is is say, um, get a, a group of thoughtful, interested people into a room and spend some time diving into the most opposing of the choices in front of you. So you're trying to think about the structure of our sales team. 
Um, and we have a whole bunch of people who believe that we should be completely decentralized because that enables us to be agile and it lets us um, be very responsive to our clients and, and you know, lets people be entrepreneurs. And other people believe that we need to be much more centralized because we'll get economies of scale and we'll right. have more alignment. And what we tend to do in that situation is debate, argue who's right, who's wrong, or um, so again, weigh, weigh the pros and cons. What we would do is say, all right, let's just take a couple of minutes and tease these out. Let's push them out. What would it look like if we had a totally decentralized approach? Let's just briefly describe that. Um, what would be the incentive structure and the reporting structure and all of those things? And then briefly describe totally decentralized, centralized and decentralized, both sides. And then um, we seek to fall in love <laughs> with each of those opposing answers. And we use that language very intentionally. We seek to understand what would actually be truly great about being completely decentralized. What would be great for our customers? What would be great for the sales team? What would be great for us as an organization if we took that approach? What does it get us? that we couldn't have otherwise. You do that for decentralization and then you do exactly the same thing for centralization. And, and we do try to make them as extreme as we can because of course there are a million possible uh, versions uh, of a structure between being wholly centralized and decentralized. But the more tension you can produce and the more pure the extremes, the, the greater chance you have to get garner insights from the process and and seek when you hold those two models in tension and you really look at the benefits of the two, you can start to say, okay, well, what is it I truly value here? What assumptions am I making that if I question them, I might be able to build something new? Um, what are the effects that come out of this that are caused one way now, but I might be able to uh, cause them a different way in future? And is there a better answer possible? Uh, and better isn't perfect. It's just what could we do to bring these two models together to bring the benefits we most care about together in a way that creates new value is better than just choosing is better than what we're doing today. All right. My head is spinning. So I want to break it down because this is so good. I'm thinking like, oh, my gosh, there's so many layers to this that I want to understand. And the, I think the process, Jennifer, that you just laid out is really powerful. So I want to I want to back up and hit on a few parts that I think are really important. Um, and I love for our launch readers to truly understand. So one is in the very beginning, you had said you'd ask people to seek to fall in love. And that language was very intentional. Will you talk a little bit about why you use that language and what you get out of that language that you don't get out of? All right. What's the benefits? of this approach, even though you maybe don't agree with it? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I have a point of view about um, how we talk about choices and, and how we talk about people's roles in organizations. And we tend to treat um, our professional selves as these rational, emotionless beings, right? Yeah. We, we just need to make really rational choices and we pretend that we aren't all deeply emotional and navigating the balance of rationality and emotionality all the time in everything we do. And so I lean into the fact that part of the reason we choose models is not a pure quantitative assessment of risk benefit, um, NPV, all of the sort of th things we learn in school that are the way we're supposed to make decisions. Sometimes it's that they feel right. Sometimes it's that there's an emotional connection. And, and so when we say we want you to fall in love with the model, it means we want you to go a little beyond sort of just listing the most yeah, obvious yeah. benefits and really say a person who believes in this model, a person who truly has heart for this model and would choose it, what is it that they care about in this model? What is it that it gives them? And the words fall in love just raises it to, I think, a higher threshold than saying, tell me what's good about this model. You know, I have to tell you, you know, I, I have the privilege of interviewing a lot of thought leaders like you. And one of the themes I've really heard time and time again recently, and I've talked about in my keynotes, is this whole flawed view of we should leave our emotions at the door <laughs> when we go to work. I just, And as you were talking about that, I was just thinking about all the times it's come up in the last, you know, month in these conversations mm -hmm. of how that actually works against us. Well, and it's impossible. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why do it? 
<laughs> like we're pretending that we can be something we're not. And what's more, if even if we could, even if we could take all of our emotional dimension out of ourselves at work, then we're setting ourselves up even more so to be replaced by artificial intelligence, right? Because right. what are the machines going right. to do? They're going to yeah, be well rational said. and predictive and unemotional because that's what machines do. Being human is the value we bring. So let's be more human. Yeah, I love it. I just, I, I'm glad you brought that up. And I'm just, I'm smiling because it's to me one of those ironic things about th this myth that we've bought into that we should be objective, objective, yet we make emotional decisions every single day. To your point, we, that's, we're humans. And mm -hmm. to your point about AI, because I think that's the other big conversation I'm hearing with a lot of our clients, you know, we add value through our emotion and through our innovation. So to, to remove that, the value that we bring to our work and life just sounds ridiculous, frankly. Why would we do that to ourselves when technology can do all that other stuff? Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. So the second part I wanted to dig into was, as you were telling the story and saying, well, what's, what is really, we fall in love with this way of doing it. And what is really the, you know, the value of it, the benefits of it. I have to assume, and I'd love to hear kind of how this plays out from your perspective, that then you're also getting, you, well, let me say it differently. You're not stuck to the how, you start to see the why behind it. If we do it this way, this is this is really what we're trying to get out of it versus caring about the how that people get, that I think so much friction creates around. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, yeah. I think that people become committed to a certain what. Yeah. Uh, I believe we should be centralized. I believe we should be decentralized. And this is unpacking a bunch of that. It, it's not centralization in and of itself that is valuable or good. That's a structure we've adopted. But what is it? What's the reason, the why that we find it valuable? What does it give us? What? Why does it help us do what we ultimately are trying to do, which is grow and get customers and be sustainable and whatever it is that it is the the sort of driving why of your organization. And so we need to get beyond the sort of label that says, this is the model I hold, this is the right answer and say, you know, what am I truly after? What are those outcomes as benefits that sit underneath the label that I truly value? So launch readers out there, I just want to pause for a second because I think this is so important. Go and do an exercise of unpacking the what, unpacking mm -hmm. the label. I love how you said that because I do think when we unpack it, we start to see the benefit and the value even in an approach that we don't necessarily initially agree with or that's not the perspective we come from. And mm -hmm. we don't we don't spend a lot of time unpacking, do we? <laughs> We do not. Yeah. <laughs> we just go right to the what. I, I, I want to flip gears a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about best practices because I read something that you wrote talking about best practices being flawed or maybe we should kind of reconsider some of our love of best practices. Will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that best practices can become pretty rote pretty fast. And um, I mean, I teach in a business school. There's a lot to love about what we do here and how we do it. But there's an implicit message that I think is flawed, which is, you know, I, I give you this Harvard business case about whatever I'm trying to teach. And you focus on what this leader did in that situation. And the implicit message is, you know, this is best practice. This is what you need to go away and do if you're ever in this situation. And I've often reflected, like, what is the likelihood that I will be in that exact situation? situation. <laughs> and so even this, the great, great CEO. So uh, Jack Welch is often referred to as the CEO of the century, right? The great CEO of the 20th century. And unless I'm running General Electric in 1985, <laughs> which is unlikely <laughs> to happen. Um, Not without a time machine. Yeah, I can't do what he did, right? Yeah. Um, we can't do what Steve Jobs did. Like, I can't reinforce enough. Don't try to be Steve Jobs. There was only one ever, and right. he succeeded in spite of himself. Right. Um, and so for me, it's about saying um, we need to understand why people have adopted the best practice that they've done. We have to think critically about what it gives us and what it doesn't and recognize that sometimes our job is to, is to make that choice better, um, to push back on it as a best practice and say, here's what... I can use and here's what I 
need to bring of my own. You know, it's it's funny that you mentioned the, the Jack Welch example, because I feel that way about the book Good to Great by Jim Collins, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. to me is how they probably got to the success that they had, but the context around them changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're still reading that book, like this, these are the best practices in business and in leadership. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a client actually come to me and say, half the companies in here don't even exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, God, that was so powerful when he said that to me, because I just thought, whoa, it really was such a great reminder of to your point like if unless you're doing it in 1985 when they did it not just who but when and how and everything else i mean you can pull some stuff out of it yes but it's not going to be the same yes exactly and and i think it's again it's unpacking it's saying why did jack welsh do what he did why did steve jobs do what he did what was the thinking what drove it what what mm. about the context led for that to be the right answer and so instead of saying, well, I need to you know, build a Crotonville because that's what Jack did, you say, like, what was his belief about his role as a leader that made that a reasonable action to take? And does that belief resonate with me in my context? Does it make sense? Do you think that we love our best practices or maybe we focus on them too much because it gives us an anchor to start with? I think sometimes, particularly in the space of innovation, and I say that broadly as in, you know, when you're doing something new and different or when you're trying to push the limits, we want help figuring yeah. out what to do. I think that's true. And again, it goes back to our our natural cognitive biases. We feel much more comfortable in certainty. We feel much more comfortable when we feel done. And for me, I want to make a distinction in kinds of best practices because I believe there are kinds of best practices that are helpful and there are mm -hmm. kinds that aren't. So you can think of best practices as falling into one of two categories. Um, there are heuristics, so rules of thumb, uh, structures that help us order our world but provide a lot of room for our own individual judgment and decision-making within those parameters. I think those kinds of best practices are extraordinarily helpful. But a lot of best practices naturally become algorithmic. Mm -hmm. These are the very specific steps that you must follow. And if you do not follow them, you are not following best practice and it becomes rote. It lacks creativity. It doesn't provide room for you to bring yourself and your judgment and your decision making into it. And, and so like, people love to do things like they'll we hear people now slamming Agile, for instance. Yeah, Agile yeah. was the savior and now we're slamming it. And it's not Agile. It's the fact that we took a thing that was meant to be a broad framework, a, a way of helping us structure our thinking, and we turned it into this algorithm, th this list of thou shalts. And if you uh, try to do anything that is even slightly outside the algorithm, you are, are, are disobeying the laws of Agile. And I think that it loses its value the value that came from saying, here's a structure within which you can create that's helping you have a different kind of conversation. Um, and I understand why we want to move to the algorithm. It's, it's a way that we can ensure that there are predictable outcomes, that we can replicate those outcomes, but those outcomes become less valuable. You know, you just added a ton of clarity to a conversation I had last week with uh, some IT leaders who mm -hmm. were super frustrated with Agile. But mm -hmm. what they were really frustrated with was the specific timing mm -hmm. of Agile, and they couldn't keep up with the timing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of to what you're saying is in the book, it says do it this way because you've got to put the methodology behind it. But if they had unpacked it, like you're suggesting, which for launch readers, I think is so powerful to think about how to unpack all this stuff. If they'd unpacked it. I think the real thing they'd be asking themselves is, how can we iterate faster yes. and how do we experiment more, which yes. is a different conversation than how do we hit our two week or six week, whatever it is, deadline. Exactly right. Right. The intention is to say it needs to be time bounded and short. Yeah. Bursts. And then we say two weeks. And if it's not two weeks, it's not agile. Um, so I think we have to loosen that up a little bit if we really want to embrace the intention. I want to go back to your book. Um, okay. What surprises or insights did you get while writing it? Was there anything that just popped out of you like, wow, was not expecting that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. And, and it's a little different for us. I think the way that we wrote this book, um, when people say, how long did it take you to write it? I say, there are two answers. The short answer is, you know, a summer. The long answer is a decade. Because right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. we spent a lot of time building out this theory. Roger, 
my co-author, he had come up with the idea of integrative thinking, the what of it. And we spent a decade figuring out the how, the process mm. you go through, what, uh, what questions you need to ask, how you can collaborate with a group to do it. And so a lot of the surprises came in that development process and a little bit less in the, in the actual writing of it. Um, some of the, pro- the, the surprises that came as we developed the theory, um, certainly how important it is to focus on the positives of the models at the outset. Um, it is interesting what happens when we allow ourselves to, to fall into the devil's advocate role really early in a process. Mm, yeah. It does shut down our ability to be generative and explore possibilities and be creative. It's just a different kind of mindset. And so the reason for focusing on the positives of the opposing models is that it allows you to be more generative. It allows you to play in a way that um, focusing on the negatives just doesn't allow. It sort of shuts you down. So that would be um, one of the big surprises for me. So that is so finding the positives. It sounds like if I hear you right, it's not just a matter of kind of unpacking, but also of shifting your mindset to being mm-hmm. open to seeing new possibilities. Absolutely, because part of what we're saying is a better answer might be possible. Mm -hmm. Maybe not right now, maybe not in the next 10 minutes. But if you do not believe that on some fundamental level, if you if you are pessimistic about the the possibility of a future better model, it becomes really difficult to find one. It, you know, it's it's interesting because I know there are launch shooters out there right now in companies listening going, oh, that person is so frustrating, right? The, the <laughs> person who shot and, and I'm with you. I actually love the yes butters. They have something to offer. It's a matter of how you pull it out of them. So mm-hmm. what's your suggestion for dealing with that? So you've, you, you've moved past this. You're doing more integrative thinking. You know there's better solutions. How do you get the people around the table to come on board with you? Is it a matter of kind of shifting to that? What do you love and what we're talking about and getting some of that positivity or is there more to it? I think it's partly that. And I think in real time, it's sometimes as simple as saying, um, you tell me more about how you see this, say more, um, instead of arguing why they're wrong, just opening up. And, And it is very often that you need to demonstrate your own willingness to question your own models, to challenge them, uh, first so that other people will feel comfortable doing so, particularly if you're a leader. Um, it's permission granting to yeah. say, I see that. I think this is a pretty good answer, but I could absolutely be missing something. What are other ways of thinking about this? Or, you know, it feels like we're kind of facing an either or choice here. I wonder if it's possible for us to think of an answer that's even better than choosing. How might we think about that? Could we spend 20 minutes just uh, trying to figure out what's good about the choices in front of us and whether there's some better way to go? Um Often it is a, a conversational approach, um, but it's generosity too. It's being genuinely curious about another person's perspective. And the cool thing is that if we are genuinely curious fairly consistently, maybe not the first time, but fairly consistently, then cognitive biases start to work for us. Reciprocity suggests that if you are open and interested in other people's perspectives, um, over time, it's really hard for them not to reciprocate and be uh, curious about you as well. Huh, I never really thought of it that way. So the more open I am, the more open they'll then be to me. Ideally. And it might, again, not be the first meeting. Yeah, over time. <laughs> um, but you are demonstrating a willingness to open yourself to uh, inquiry, to play with your own uh, models. And it, in some ways, is a very confident stance. I believe that I have a good model, but I'm confident enough in our ability to be collaborative, in my ability to think with you together in real time, that I'm happy to explore with you what a better answer could be. You know, I love that. I always find that the most confident people are the ones who are willing to say, well, tell me more about where you're coming from, or I don't know the answer. What do you think? And sometimes we tend to see that as a weakness. Yeah. But those to me are the ones that are most confident because you've got to have some thick skin to say, hey, I don't know, or I'm open to new ideas. Yeah, I had a, a chance a few months ago to talk to someone who was on uh, Barack Obama's senior team. And she talked a lot about, I mean, people tend to think of him as a pretty confident guy. Um, and he would absolutely be the person in the room who was always apparently asking for different perspectives and, and challenging his own thinking and seeing whether there was an answer that could bring them together. Um 
And yeah, I think that people would, would typically think of him as pretty decisive and pretty confident. Before I ask you the last question, where can people to go to connect with you and to learn more? So uh, a couple of places. So my co-author has his own website, rogerlmartin.com, and that's a great place to go. You can find me at the Rotman School, um, and it's just you Google Rotman School, and, you, and you'll find me through there. Um, and I'm on Twitter a lot, so you can find me. I'm just at Jennifer Riel on Twitter. All right. So my last question is twofold. One is why focus on great choices versus, I don't know, innovation, decision making? I was just very curious about that because to me, it really stood out as different than I think a lot of the other types of books out there. And then what are three things from that book or maybe even just one big one that we can do right now to make those great choices? So I, I lean pretty hard into the language of choices. And I, I think it's because of how I think about strategy and what strategy is. I think there's a lot of myth out there about strategy being a six month process in which you produce a really thick binder and it's mm. got budgets and PowerPoint presentations. Exactly. And, yeah. um, I, I tend to believe in the, in the original sort of Mike Porter definition of strategy, which is that strategy is just a set of choices about what you will do and what you won't do to mm. win in a particular way. Um, we can all do that. We all do that all the time. We're all strategic. We all are making choices. And I think a career and an organization are an accumulation of choices. Are we making choices that are aligned and thoughtful and smart and generative and, and creative, or are we making choices that are scattershot and counterproductive and limited? And the more we can do to move ourselves to a place where we're thoughtful about the choices we're making we are embracing our role as as people who create choices. I think we have a better shot at a great career and a great organization. That's a great way to say it. And I never really thought of that of just what you're willing to do and not to do. Like when you said that, it just sounds so simple. Like, oh, that is what a choice is. You're right. I can do that. What's one thing I should think about doing moving forward? So the one thing I'd encourage people to think about doing moving forward is um, really – thinking about how you define your job when it comes to choices. So do you see, do you see yourself as someone whose job it is to make the tough choice, make the trade off, be analytical and choose and move on with your life? Or do you see yourself, yourself as someone whose job it is to take the raw materials the world gives you and create something new and it was why it was interesting for me to come and do this podcast in particular, because I think a lot of your listeners do see themselves as innovators, do yeah. see themselves as people who are creating great change in the world. And that's true of their organizations. And, and I would encourage them to think about it um, as being true of themselves as leaders as well. God, that is wonderful advice to end on. Jennifer, I, this really has my head spinning. And I really meant that as a good thing. I'm like, wow, I got so many things I need to think about. I took so many notes. Um, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on. I hope we can have you on again, because I feel like we have more and more digging to do around making great choices. But it's fantastic. It was great fun. And I'd be happy to do it again. I mean, so many layers of knowledge bombs. Am I right? I really like the part about seeking out and creating disagreement in tension and how the best innovation can be found inside that tension. I mean, bam. But here's the thing I've learned with creating tension or what we refer to here at Launch Street as constructive conflict. While it's essential to innovation, totally believe that, it can go bad fast. It gets personal. It gets ugly. Have you ever been there? You start debating each other, not the ideas. You have to set the stage for conflict in a way that avoids those traps. Now, no need to be concerned because you know we got your back. If you have access to our innovation on demand platform, there's an entire lesson on just that. The language to use to make sure conflict is constructive, not destructive. If you're a member, go get access to it, watch that micro lesson and go create some tension. If you're not yet a member, I would suggest you go check out our website, go to launchstreet.com, G-O-T-O launchstreet.com, click on innovation on demand and get some access. Okay, go make some tension happen. Tomorrow out. 
Thanks for hanging out with us inside Launch Street. When you're ready to take your game to the next level, join the thousands of others that are upping their innovation edge on go to launchstreet.com, the top online education resource and community platform for innovators looking to use innovation to get measurable results. Go to launchstreet.com.